It's humbling to think that science is literally in the dark about 95% of the universe. For physicists now tell us that the vast majority of the universe might be made up of dark matter and dark energy. This is matter and energy that obviously cannot be seen and therefore cannot be directly examined or studied, cannot be directly pictured by our telescopes or analysed under our microscopes. Therefore, we're literally in the dark about it. But I want to suggest that a dominant philosophical tradition in continental thought has been making a similar claim for decades now that science is literally in the dark about the most significant percentage of reality. Now it might be very difficult to conceive, but if the tabloids did an article about this continental philosophical tradition known as phenomenology, the headline might be something like, Science in the Dark. And if the broadsheets did an equivalent, it might be a little bit more literary, and it might be the dark night of the scientific soul. But why would this philosophical tradition suggest that the natural sciences are in the dark about the most significant proportion of reality? Let me use an illustration to try and make this point. When the interplanetary explorers Voyager 1 and 2 spacecraft were first sent out into the solar system to investigate a variety of planets, it became clear that after their investigations, they would be off to the wider universe beyond our solar system. Those who constructed these explorers thought they needed to put something on them to summarise our life on Earth, just in case they were encountered by some alien intelligence. The Voyager Golden Records are two records that were included aboard both Voyager spacecraft launched in 1977 and are intended for any intelligent extraterrestrial life form who may find them. The records are a sort of time capsule. But what should they include to give a good description of human life on Earth? Well, the paradigm for knowledge in our modern world is of course the natural sciences. So surely the best way to describe life on Earth would be to give a scientific description. So the first images are of scientific interest, showing mathematical and physical quantities. DNA and human anatomy and reproduction. So let us imagine that the Voyager ultimately encounters alien intelligence and they are now able to play the gold discs so they have a complete scientific description of humanity and its world. But has that scientific description of humanity given that extraterrestrial life a good account of us and our significance? Given just that scientific information, would they have any real understanding of what it means to be part of humanity, or any grasp of its significance and the world it's created? Even Carl Sagan and the other leading scientists who put the gold disc together realised that just that scientific data alone would not have been enough that even a complete scientific description of us would have been inadequate and would have left that alien intelligence in the dark about what is most significant about humanity. Consequently, they included a great deal more than just that scientific description of humanity and our life on this planet. Surely that alone should give us pause for thought that even if we shared the very paradigm of modern knowledge that we find in the natural sciences, anyone receiving that with information would still be at a loss to understand humanity's significance and would still struggle to grasp even a fraction of what it means to be human and the world humanity inhabits. But let's explore in more detail and with a bit of imagination why that's the case. Now let's imagine from what we've given them, that our inquisitive alien intelligence, in terms of our physical makeup, now have a complete understanding of our planet's chemical and atomic construction, so that they are now able to get a thorough scientific description of humanity and our environment. This is where you need a real leap of imagination. 
let us also imagine that they have the technology to analyze our planet with the information we've given them from where they are. Now, what might they look at first on planet Earth? Well, they might be attracted to what is emitting the most sound and the most light. And of course, that would be the world's major cities. I grew up on the outskirts of London, so an analysis of that major city works very well for me. What would their physical scientific analysis of London, its buildings, its major institutions, tell them about its significance? For example, what would their physical analysis of London make of the major buildings and institutions, say the British Library, the National Gallery, the Albert Hall, the Houses of Parliament, the University of London? What would their scientific analysis of the physical structure of things make of those institutions? Well, I believe from that physical analysis alone, they would know nothing of the true nature of the British Library, nothing of the real nature of the National Gallery, and nothing of the meaning of the Na Albert Hall. Their purely physical analysis might pick up the fact that there are lots of coloured pigments in the National Gallery, lots of noise coming from the Albert Hall, Lots of hot air coming from the Houses of Parliament and the University of London. And that the chemical components that make up paper predominate in the British Library. But nothing more than that. As far as their meaning is concerned, their nature of these institutions are concerned, their true significance, they would still be at a loss. For the chemical and atomic components that make up paper don't tell you anything of the meaning of what's written on that paper. Knowing what pigments make up all the individual paintings in the National Gall Gallery tell you nothing with reference to what a picture is or great work of art is. And measuring how many decibels of sound come from the Albert Hall would tell you nothing about the significance and nature of music and what if great composition is. And knowing how much hot air is admitted from the Houses of Parliament or the University of London would tell you nothing about the meaning or nature of political debate or about rational and intellectual discourse. In fact, a total scientific analysis of all these major institutions would leave you completely at a loss about their true nature and their real meaning. They would know nothing about understanding art, nothing about understanding music, nothing about understanding prose and poetry or philosophy or religion or politics. So much of humanity would be literally a closed book to them. They would, as we said at the beginning, still be totally in the dark about the nature of humanity. Now, all I've been doing in this story of inquisitive aliens is having a bit of fun dramatising a point that's been made repeatedly by those sympathetic to continental philosophy and particularly to the tradition of phenomenology. As the philosopher Roger Scruton explains the point, we don't understand the plays of Shakespeare by conducting surveys and experiments. We don't interpret the art of fugue with an acoustical analysis or Michelangelo's David with the crystallography of marble. Art, literature, music, and history belong to the world that is shaped by our own consciousness, and we study them not by explaining how they arose, but by interpreting what they mean. But to fully grasp the point, it may be good to look at some examples in more detail. The different institutions I have referred to, of course, embody a number of key areas of human achievement. The Albert Hall hosts, for example, the BBC Proms each summer and every imaginable form of music throughout the rest of the year. So, Roger Scruton, as we have seen, not only explains the point we have been making in general terms, but also looks at the example of music in some detail. If you look for music in the order of nature, you will not find it. Of course, you will find sounds, which is to say pitched vibrations, caused as a rule by human activity, and impinning on the ears of those who listen to them. But you won't find any of the features that distinguish music. 
You won't find melodies, those strange things that begin and end and move through musical space between their vivid edges. You won't find tones, the elements from which melodies are composed, but only the pitched sounds in which we hear them. Music is all appearance, and yet it is not an illusion or a passing veneer that we could fail to notice and be none the worse for not noticing. Roger Scruton insists that music is as much a reality out there as it is an experience within us, but it's a reality we do not get access to via the natural sciences and therefore can never fully comprehend from that third person scientific perspective. Presented with that description of music, you might well ask whether it is a description of something real. To which I answer yes, though it is a reality that cannot be grasped from the ordinary cognitive standpoint. No science, no theory, no form of explanation with which we order and predict the physical world, could possibly make contact with the movement that we hear when we hear a melody in musical space. An expert in acoustics could give you a complete account of a musical theme, an account that would enable you to reproduce it by following his instructions. Such an expert would describe sequences of pitched sounds, not musical tones. The acoustician and the musical listener apprehend what they hear in two different ways. As we have seen when considering the National Gallery, there is an analogy here with understanding a work of art or comprehending a painting. Music is inaudible, except to those with the cognitive capacity to hear movement in musical space, orientation, tension, and release, the gravitational force of the bass notes, the goal-directedness and action profile of melodies, and so on. These things that we hear in music are not illusions, someone who fails to hear them does not hear all that there is to hear, just as someone who fails to see the face in a picture fails to see all that is there. Music is certainly part of the real world. But it is perceivable only to those who are able to conceptualize and respond to sound in ways that have no part to play in the physical science of acoustics. All the examples we have looked at, and will be examining further, highlight a distinction between the perspective of third-person scientific description and objective analysis, and our world of first-person lived experience, one alive with the richest of meanings and the highest of significance. This is a distinction famously and extensively developed by the philosopher Edmund Husserl, a founder of modern phenomenology. He argues that our experience of music, of art, of prose, of poetry, rational debate, moral debate, in fact all the institutions we looked at at the beginning, can be seen to inhabit a world incomprehensible to the strictures of scientific analysis. What he describes as a life world. So, as Roger Scruton argues, when I appreciate music, I am lifting the sounds out of the physical realm and repositioning them in the Lebenswelt, which is a world of freedom, reason, and interpersonal being. This Lebenswelt or life world is a world that contains melodies as well as sounds, faces as well as physiognomies, meanings as well as causes. And all these are real and objective features of it, even if they are never mentioned in the book of empirical science. This life world is defined as the very structure of meaning we inhabit in our everyday lives. It's the world of human culture, of social significance, of interpersonal relationships, of artistic appreciation, that gives our experience meaning and value. But as we've seen, cannot be accessed by the purely physical or scientific account of reality. Here we see the traditional distinction between fact and value, but the distinction is applied here to things as we experience them in our surrounding world. Thus, I experience objects as objective matters of fact, but also, in many cases, as bearing value. For instance, I see the clouds gathering on the horizon, a matter of fact, but I also see the beautiful sunset, a matter of value. The life world, carrying values, is the ground or background of our experience of all things, including our experience of things as having values. In other words, it is. 
The world is immediately or directly experienced in the subjectivity of everyday life, as sharply distinguished from the objective worlds of the sciences, which employ the methods of the mathematical sciences of nature. The life world is, unsurprisingly, the world we live in. It is the world that we take for granted in daily life, it is the pre-theoretical world of experience, which we are all acquainted with, and which we typically do not question but has been forgotten and repressed by science. This is not to deny the importance of science. It's just the claim that science is not telling us the whole story. It's not giving us the complete picture. That if we just pursue a scientific perspective on a physical reality, we will remain in the dark about a whole world of human values and significance. Phenomenology is not out to dispute the value of science and is not denying that scientific investigations can lead to new insights and expand our understanding of reality. But phenomenologists do reject the idea that natural science can provide an exhaustive account of reality. For phenomenology, the question of whether something is real or not, does not depend on whether it can fit the Procrustean bed of quantifiable science. Our world of experience has its own criteria of validity and truth and does not have to await the approval of science. As Edmund Husserl explains. Someone who is raised on natural science takes it for granted that everything merely subjective must be excluded and that the natural scientific method determines objectivity. This then leads to the conclusion that as he put it, objectivist science takes what it calls the objective world for the universe of all that is in his study of the legacy of Husserl's phenomenology, Dan Sahavi explains how the argument from science works. All genuine questions are natural scientific questions and all genuine knowledge is objective knowledge gained by natural scientific means that reality consists only of those entities' properties and structures that are or could be accepted by natural science. That the resolutely third-person methods of natural science are considered to provide the sole means of access to the world. This commitment amounts to the view that everything which exists, including everything pertaining to human life such as consciousness, meaning, rationality, normativity values culture or history has to be studied by the methods of natural science and is ultimately reducible to natural scientific facts. But as the philosopher John Cottingham has argued, to take that approach and to deny the reality of the life world is to undermine the reality of every human endeavour, including science itself. The world presented to consciousness is as real as can be, not a mere shadow or byproduct or epiphenomenon or magic show, but the very touchstone of truth. Anyone who denies it, or tells us that some other world, of mathematical entities, or particle interactions, or anything else, is more real than the life world of which I and you have immediate awareness, is denying the fundamentally present reality that is the basis on which any philosophical or scientific theorizing must ultimately be built. But once that life world is taken seriously, the philosopher John Cottingham argues this may have religious implications. Once we have given up the prejudice that only the scientific image of the world corresponds to what is real, once we acknowledge the reality of the whole rich presence of the world around us, once we acknowledge all this, then we need to ask what the existence of this reality amounts to. Once we have made the move of acknowledging the reality of the life world presented to us as conscious subjects, then in integrity we have to try to fit this into an overall world picture that allows for such a reality. And since we cannot suppose that this world is created by us, and if, furthermore, we cannot see how it could be derived from the principles of physics, then we can hardly refuse to consider the theistic alternative. On this view, what sustains the world and each individual conscious subject in existence is not the material cosmos, the vast concatenation of processes studied by physics, but the transcendent primordial and personal subject that is taken in traditional theism to be the source and sustainer of all being. Philosophical discourse, so it seems to me, is seldom if ever a matter of coercive argument, but has more to do with trying to show how certain frameworks of interpretation are hospitable to coming to terms with the existential and moral challenges inherent in our human predicament. A theistic framework is hospitable to accommodating, 
our ability to inhabit the life world and thereby gain access to a rich domain of irreducible meaning and value. I'm delighted that the St. John's timeline has now found a new home. We are working with the Christian publisher, Hymns ANN, and the new website hosts all the videos we have produced over the last 12 years, including plenty of new material. There is over 160 videos, 100 hours of quality content, which we are known for. There is a low annual subscription fee, and all the profits will be going to produce new videos. The link to stjohnstimeline.org is in the video description below.